Okay. All right, well, I'm gonna start us off right now and hopefully we'll get some other folks trickling in. Um, for those of you I have not met, I, I recognize some names here and not others. My name is Katherine Leonard. I'm the State Historic Preservation Officer uh, here in Arizona. Uh, and this is the second in a series of uh, book clubs that we have, book club discussions that we have planned for this year uh, in, uh, in cooperation with the Arizona Preservation Foundation. So the idea here is for us to read books that are not necessarily books about historic preservation, but are books that are preservation adjacent, and that strike on themes that uh, folks who are interested in um, their environment, whether it's built environment or the natural world around them, would find interesting. Um, and so it is with great pleasure today uh, that I bring you together uh, to uh, discuss the book Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. And we have a fantastic moderator for you tonight. So I'm going to introduce you to her um, and then get her started on her way because she's going to give us a little bit of a presentation before we launch into our, our discussion. Um, and here we go. Um, so with me here, you see her on the screen is Carrie Cannon. She is a member of the Kiowa tribe of Oklahoma and she's also of o Oglala Lakota descent. She has a bachelor's in science and wildlife biology and a master's in science and resource management. And she began working for the Wallapai tribe of Peach Springs, Arizona in 2005, where she began the creation of an intergenerational ethnobotany program for the Wallapai community. She's still employed as an ethnobotanist for the Wallapai Department of Cultural Resources. And there she administers several projects that promote intergenerational teaching of Wallapai ethnobotanical knowledge, working towards preservation and revitalization to ensure that tribal ethnobotanical knowledge persists at Wallapai as a living practice and tradition. So with that, I'm going to pass the, uh, the Zoom baton over to Carrie, uh, and she is going to start her presentation. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I wanna thank both Alicia and Catherine for um, inviting me and um, facilitating your bi-monthly uh, book club. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, let's see. So yeah, I was asked to uh, share a little bit about the work that I do for 15 or 20 minutes and then we can launch into discussing um, the book that we all read. And so, um, I know Catherine covered some of this in my introduction, but uh, I am employed as an ethnobotanist with the Wallapai Indian Tribe of Arizona. They are one of uh, 22 federally recognized tribes in the state. And so um, here you can see where the reservation is. It's just about a million acres in Northwestern Arizona, and it follows 108 miles of the south rim of the Grand Canyon along Western Grand Canyon, which is the Northern boundary of the reservation. However, the ancestral land actually encompasses more like 7 million acres of Northwestern Arizona. And this is the cultural center where I work, which also happens to be a tribal historic preservation office. And a little bit of background. I first came to the Walpi Reservation as a, as a wildlife biologist. So instead of working with the cultural center where I work today, I started at the natural resources department and I was in charge of managing the tribe's big game uh, species, including elk, desert bighorn sheep, and antelope, um, doing population assessments, um, doing flyovers to, to figure out the populations, um, which was geared towards the tribe's ho uh, trophy hunting that they market to the outside world, which is part of their revenue stream. Um, so I would do the surveys and then make recommendations to the tribal council on how many tags to itch, issue each season so that they wouldn't over harvest the population. Um, and it was through that job that I actually ended up taking more of an interest in learning the plant knowledge. And so I was able, in the freedom of my job, I was able to um, get permission and, and seek the, um, the permission of the tribal community to create an ethnobotany program where we could have the elders teach the plant knowledge to the youth. So I was able to do that in this position. And then later I went back to school, did a master's in research management, did a thesis on multi ethnobotany. And then the cultural center decided to hire me on to continue to do ethnobotany full-time. 
So I kind of transitioned from natural resources into cultural resources. And so this is just kind of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is work with the tribal community to promote the passing of knowledge from elder to youth about um, the traditional, traditional ecological knowledge. Um, so a little bit of background about myself. Um, on my mother's side, I'm of German ancestry. And if you look closely at this photo in the upper right, um, they're actually standing in a greenhouse. And this, is, this photo was taken in Germany. And the little boy in the photo is my grandfather, Hans. And he immigrated to the United States with his family as a young boy um, just after World War I. They immigrated to Portland, Oregon, and his parents um, established a greenhouse there. And then when he grew up, he established his own greenhouse. And so my mom grew up helping, helping him rearing plants. And then on my father's side, I'm of both Kiowa and Oglala Sioux ancestry. So my Sioux relatives are up here from Pine Ridge, South Dakota. This is my grandmother. She was the eldest twin of 13 children, 11 that survived into adulthood. And this was her mother, my great grandmother, um, Lucy. And then this is all of them. Well, my grandmother and my great grandmother at Pine Ridge and that little boy's my dad. And then on my father's father's side, so my grandfather's side, I'm of Kiowa ancestry, which is a tribe in Oklahoma. And that's the tribe I'm enrolled in. And so this is uh, my great, great grandfather, Two Hatchets and my great, great grandmother, Spotted Wing. And Spotted Wing, as it turns out, was a plant medicine person. So she knew the healing plants of the Kiowa people. So on both sides of my lineage, I have that plant ancestry. So I feel very blessed to be doing the work that I do. It feels like it was written in the stars from the beginning. And so this is some of the family that I go back to see in Oklahoma on my Kiowa side. I try to make it back there at least once a year. And sometimes I'm able to make it to some of our traditional dances like the Gord Clan dance, um, more family photos, more of our, um, some of our Kiowa traditional dances back in Oklahoma. And our ancestral lands kind of really span a wide region um, originally, our earliest memory and our, or, our oral traditions, um, our origin story takes us to the, uh, the headwaters of the Yellowstone River up in Montana. And from there, um, we eventually became a Southern Plains tribe and migrated south. And then by the time of colonial influences, we were in the region of um, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas. And we were um, very much uh, a warrior-based tribe that hunted buffalo and did a lot of raiding. And so all these little dash lines are different raids that we did going all the way down far into Mexico, into Mesoamerica actually on some of these raids. So just like a very um, traveling uh, tribe with a lot of interest in, in seeing the world. So um, this is kind of an interesting map that, that traces our, our travels um, across the continent really. And uh, in my everyday work, I, I work on Wallapai Ethnobotany. That's where, you know, that's where I live and that's where I have been for almost two decades. But I do have an interest in my own, my own tribe's ethnobotany as well. Um, I'm sorry, I think, do I have to be the one to admit new people or is someone else uh, co? I, I will be doing that. Thank you for okay, asking Okay, thank, thank you, Alicia. Um, so I just wanted to uh, show this. This is just kind of a little interesting tidbit on Kiowa ethnobotany, but, um, there's a there's a plant that um, it's called slippery elm in English, but in uh, in the Kiowa language they have two different words for it. One of them is saddlewood, and the other is buffalo wood, and it's it's for the knowledge, um, the ecological knowledge about this plant. One is that the uh, branches were used for making the traditional style saddles, and also for the knowledge that this is where the buffalo would um, gather to find shade, and so. Um, there's a lot of a lot of times the uh, tribal names of the plants tell you something um, about the plant. And uh, even though I work with the Wallapai and uh, and really enjoy that work, I also have taken an interest in my own tribe's ethnobotany. And so I've done every time I go out to Oklahoma, I just kind of dig around and do more and more research about our ethnobotany and some of our um, cultural ancestry. And so this is a traditional uh, Kiowa saddle. And uh, we also have language revitalization efforts. The Kiowa tribe received an ANA grant, so they've been doing different efforts to preserve the language. 
And then now I'm just going to kind of transition and, and really talk about the work that I do at Wallopi. And I just want to, I don't like reading slides, but I'm just going to read this one because I feel like it, it's helpful in understanding what the field of ethnobotany is about. Um, and I know everybody knows what botany is. It's the study of plants. Not everybody knows what ethnobotany is, but you can kind of think of it as the crossroads of anthropology, the study of human cultures, and botany, the study of plants, where those two fields converge. So oftentimes people think of ethnobotany as only the plants tribal people use or used for food. Ethnobotany, however, is much more encompassing. It includes plants used for food, medicine, tools, cooking implements, weapons, ceremonies, homes, clothing, plants used in trade, and even can include tribal taxonomic ideologies far different from those of Western Linnaean systems, which are based more solely on flower morphology. And so um, we began our Ethnobotany Youth Project in 2006 through grant funds, and we've been able to keep it going ever since. And I just wanna acknowledge uh, the Wallapai elders that I have worked with and um, that has shared their knowledge with the tribal youth as well as myself, um, the late Melinda Powski, the late Dolores Honga, Lucille Wadahamaji, Cheryl Beecher, Georgine Paya, the late Drake Cavatone, and Frank Mapatis. And so as part of our ethnobotany program, which is grant funded, we were able to keep this project going year after year by finding different grant resources to fund it. Um, but we were able to use an existing ethnobotany book and reprint it um, that had been done decades earlier at the bilingual school on the reservation. And so we use this ethnobotany book as our curriculum. We also created a new book. We, we created a recipe book of the, of the Wallapai uh, tribe. And then we created a deck of flashcards that had the uh, tribal uses of the plants and the, and the tribal names. Um, and then a little bit about my uh, master's work. Um, I did a, uh, Master of Science and Resource Management, and uh, I worked on creating um, an ethnobotany database that could be included or, or um, added to an existing cultural atlas that um, our previous archaeologist had developed through um, uh, national park funds. And so essentially, this was just creating a comprehensive location for all Wallapai ethnobotanical information. So there was a lot of information from elders from um, publications that had been done in the 1980s when the tribe had an active bilingual program and they created a lot of curriculum materials on ethnobotany. Then there were documents um, from early anthropologists spanning from the 1930s to the 1950s on. And so um, many, many different sources of, of um, plant information about Wallapai, but no concentrated resource for all of this to be synthesized. So my thesis was about creating the, a comprehensive database where all of this information could be um, archived and accessed for tribal members and future families. And so I just want to show, I'll just run through these kind of uh, quickly, but this is some of what we do um, with our ethnobotany program. We um, go with the seasons and we harvest the different foods that are available at different times of the year, and then we process it in a traditional manner. Sometimes we do it the old way, and sometimes we do it using contemporary modern tools. Sometimes we do the old recipes and sometimes we um, cook things in a more contemporary way that um, people can be more accustomed to. So this is the bananaica, the manat, daquis is the choya bud, nal is the mesquite bean, and then a jebevi is a blanket. So a hlo jebevi is um, a cottontail rabbit blanket. And so these, as you can see in the photo, used to be made to get through wintertime and it takes it actually takes 200 rabbit pelts to make a blanket of this size. And so um, those rabbits aren't very big and every little um, scrap of their hide is put to use. And these blankets are really kind of a work of art. Um, also doing some of the traditional clothing with the jikyao, which is the cliff rose bark, harvesting the prickly pear, the saguaro fruit. So mostly Wallapai uh, ancestral land is located in the eastern extent of the Mojave Desert. But some of the different bands of the tribe, and there's 14 different bands of Wallapai that span the geography of that 7 million acres of ancestral land. Some of the southern bands were, were far enough south that they extended into the northern extent of the Sonoran Desert where you get all the different Sonoran Desert plants like saguaro. And then the wild turnips, um, processing elk jerky, doing a plant press workshop, mounting specimens, um, do it, roasting the pinion nuts, 
Um, and also, you know, we've been pretty creative with our ethnobotany project. And so at different times of the year, we've put a different spin on, on what we try to accomplish. And so one year we, we decided we were gonna begin to do um, an, audio, an audio dictionary, which we call the talking dictionary. So we had the youth recording their elders saying the names of the plants and saying different words in the language and, and building a, a repository of the language so that people could hear the cadence of the language rather than trying to read it. We've done traditional uh, foods, cooking classes. Um, so beyond ethnobotany, I do a lot of work related to language revitalization, cultural heritage revitalization, and I do a lot of grant writing so, to support this work. So uh, we've received funding from the state organization, First Things First, that is geared towards uh, early childhood literacy. And so they've been supportive in us producing bilingual um, books for the youth, for the, the little ones. And so we created um, five different books. One was common words and phrases, and we used local tribal artists. Um, one book on kinship terms, qualify body parts, animals and geography, and lullabies. Um, and then this past year, we just finished the third year of our administration for Native American a language grant, which was a language immersion grant award that was geared towards the Head Start to provide a language immersion, both in the form of curriculum materials and um, classroom language instruction. And so we were able to create quite a few um, publications in the language, many of which had an ethnobotanical theme. Uh, we also have an herbarium and our ethnobotany program contributes to that herbarium. Um, our department goes on annual Grand Canyon River trips each year to check on the cultural and natural resources. I do line intercept studies to check on the botanical resources where we have established transects. And this is um, part of the field work that I do annually. Um, I do present some of what I'm doing at the wildlife community um, at the Society of Ethnobiology Conference on an annual basis. Um, and through our ethnobotany program, we've been able to host a native food symposium um, biennially. So we just finished our third one. Um, so every two years, we invite guest speakers from all over Indian country, and we ask them to share and present about what they're doing in their respective communities to promote the heritage knowledge of their native foodways. And this is really a form of inspiration for us to keep doing the work that we're doing by learning from others and hearing what they're doing. And so this is always a fun event that's um, really appreciated by the tribal community. Um, and then we also received a National Science Foundation documenting endangered languages at the Botany Grant. And this was geared towards um, doing a, a collaborative project. So the Wallapai tribe are ancestrally affiliated with other Pai tribes, including the different Yavapai tribes, the Havasupai, the Pai Pai down in Baja, Mexico. And so we wanted to create a ling linguistic database of the language because these languages are um, very closely related. They're in the human speaking language family and um, many languages are endangered. And so we wanted to document the language using ethnobotany as the umbrella or the framework. And then the idea was that not every tribe remembers every plant or every word. And so even though the tribes are distinct um, entities, tribes that have forgotten something, another tribe might remember it. And so it had the project had the potential to fill in gaps um, where some tribes had lost knowledge, other tribes may have had it and to be able to have a more um, comprehensive location for um, Pi ethnobotanical and linguistic knowledge. And so that was, we did receive a pilot project and we were able to do some preliminary work which was um, received well by the different Pi tribes. And then um, in, in Kiowa, Kion de Da means uh, it's a good day. And this is uh, a painting that my uncle, the late T.C. Cannon did of my great grandmother, Grace Two Hadgets. And, and she's on horseback and she's in one of those traditional style saddles that I, I always love learning about. So um, with that closing slide, I, I wanna launch into talking about the book that we've all read and um, I thought it might just be helpful to start with the first question. I'm gonna go ahead and read it. And then I'm gonna pay attention to um, 
I guess people will raise their hand if they want to tackle the question and we can have a, um, an engaged discussion. So the, what, uh, the first question is, um, a central theme of the book is reciprocity. What are your thoughts on this concept? Is this a part of your outlook? In what ways is this practiced or lacking in everyday mainstream American culture? Reflect on your views of reciprocity. And so I'm sure anybody that read the book uh, has something to say about that. Who would like to uh, be the brave soul to, to start us off? Um, let's see. So I can't, I think I need to, I'm trying to change the view so I can see everybody. Um, Carrie, in the top right, there's like a little, it should say view, and then you can have side by side with the speaker, or you could just do like the standard view. We can do, if you, if you stop sharing your, well, actually we want the questions up there. So. Okay, I think I have it how I would like it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so do people raise their hands? Is that how they? Yeah, there's, yes, and I should mention that. Um, there's a little, um, there should be a little, uh, where is it here? I don't see it. Under the reaction, yeah, under the reaction bubble, there should be um, a raise hand box. And so if you have something to contribute, if you wanna just hit that raise hand box, um, and since I'm talking, I'll, I'll start us off. Um, I, I, I mean, I think the entire theme, one of the major things that comes through in this book is this concept of reciprocity and the idea that, um, you know, we can't always be consumers. We also need to be givers and we need to offer, um, we need to be offering um, not just our gratitude to uh, the earth, but also our service to the earth um, in the form of actually giving back of healing. And um, I found this to be a really beautiful concept, but also a challenging concept for those of us, especially who live in cities. Um, and, um, you know, I'm not even talking about whether you're indigenous or non-indigenous, but like when you really are pretty far removed from the land, how would you take the principles um, that Kimmerer is talking about with respect to giving back to the land? Like what, what, what could that look like? I think that's a great point about like being in urban areas. And um, one thing that comes to mind is, um, I don't know if you guys remember when she was describing the salmon ceremony where the tribes, uh, I guess the tribes along the Col um, Columbia Plateau coming up the Columbia River, um, they would, as the spring uh, uh, spawning was happening, they would light all these fires and they would welcome the spawning fish back to their, um, from the sea back to their spawning grounds. And I remember thinking, just how beautiful that was and like um, treating the treating the natural world like your relatives welcoming them home and and uh, that's a part of sustenance for the the people but if you if you live in an area where you're not in touch with nature and um, a lot of that is just circumstance then it's really easy to be disconnected from having that relationship with um, with the natural world and I can remember uh, for my mom's 70th birthday, we flew to New York City and we were at a Starbucks and I was looking outside the window and there was this really neat looking bug that had jumped on, uh, it was on the, the glass and I was looking at it and there was a woman with her child um, looking at the bug and I thought she was going to go point it out to her child and show the child, oh, look how cool this bug is. And um, as I walked outside, we were leaving and she got close to the bug and she smashed it and she killed it. And I felt like my heart break because <laughs> I just thought it was such a special cool little bug and that this woman just smashed it in front of her child. And that's the relationship many people have with nature um, and potentially in urban areas um, where you're disconnected or you're afraid of, of nature. And so how can we give back if we don't even have a relationship to begin with, with nature. So um, maybe this book begs the question, how can we 
spend more time with nature so that we can even be tuned in to um, the natural world so that we can even have a relationship. And I'm sure there's other people that would like to share their thoughts. I'm not sure where the raise your hand button is. What, can you give us another tutorial on that? Sure, um, you go to reactions. So Where's reactions? Push, it's at the bottom. It should be like a little smiley face guy with a plus sign. And so you hit that with your cursor and then on this screen is it on my screen too it should be on everybody's screen though right does everybody is are other maybe folks... because i'm sharing maybe it's not but okay as long as you guys have the raised hand yeah. i see Kristen has something she'd like to share so yeah, please. there we go yeah hi my name is Kristen zabo i'm uh from nevada um so yeah back to the question about how we can i don't know just listening to Catherine and Carrie talk kind of sparked some thoughts. And I know, I think picking up trash when you see trash is a good thing to do, you know, whether you're in the city or in a rural area. Um, I do a lot of hiking and, you know, often will carry a bag with me and just pick up trash. You, you know, you can't imagine the things you find and where you think you're in some very far away place and you find like a Mylar balloon or, um, you know, a dental pick or just weird things. So I try to pick up trash and just keep things clean or make them cleaner than, than they were when I walked through, um, if I can. I think that's a good suggestion. I think um, just little things can be the foundation for those kind of shifts. So I have a comment here, actually, Alicia, this is from Valerie in DC. And Valerie is saying, hey, if if we are looking at a blank slide, can we just stop the screen sharing so that we can have all of us on the screen together? I was able to work around that, but yeah. Okay, there we go, that, sh that should do it. Thanks, Catherine. I said all that right. with my camera off. <laughs> so we can see each other. <laughs> hey, it was a really great suggestion. Um, yeah, you know, the, the whole concept of what we can do in an urban set. Well, first of all, for those of us who have kids, I would say we have to, we like, as part of being a human being, we must take our kids out to nature. Like we have to afford these experiences to children. Like that, I mean, as a race, and when I say races and the race of humanity, we're not going to survive this if we don't get the young folks, you know, building that was it the eighth fire that she talks about, like realizing what we've lost, going back and picking it up. I mean, I truly, this sounds like really dorky, but the more I work with um, tribal folks in my own line of work, the more I realize that where we are today is a function of something we've lost. And the folks I know who are practicing their traditional cultures. Um, and they happen to be indigenous, they, they're they onto something. They're onto something that we have somehow just completely um, just lost track of in our, our and, and, and what I love about um, Kimmerer is she's, she's so brilliant that she's able to look at it like, well, you know, when you essentially have a market-based economy that is extractive and is based on this whole concept of scarcity, then you're going to encourage people to just be consumers because that is how you need to exist in the world to be successful. You have to be a consumer. You have to own land. You have to, you know, have stuff and all of this. And we've set that up for ourselves. And that machine of just sort of the market economy just keeps moving. And the, the only antidote to that seems to be getting back to this concept of reciprocity that you can't take and take and take and take. There's, it, it will not work. Um, I don't know, I'm talking a lot, so I'm gonna hand it over to someone else who was maybe struck by that. But I, I just felt like that was such a profound theoretical place to um, engage in terms of like, hey, no, I'm not indigenous but this is what I can take away from people that are, are actively practicing these principles. Mm -hmm. Yes, Donna. Well, one of the things is, in some ways, I feel as if 
I'm an outlier because I hate to shop. Um, you know, I get <clears throat> rather nervous if anybody wants to go to a mall. Um, but I, I don't use a lot of things, and what I can, I re, I compost, and and those bugs. Now I do smash mosquitoes, <laughs> and if I'm growing squash, I am going to smash those squash bugs because they'll just you know ruin the crop. But for the most part, I'm really amazed. I love to look at 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 insects, and I can remember going on dates with my boyfriend at the time. He was taking an entomology class and finding all these interesting um, things. And I don't know, it's just, I, and I grew up in a town. I mean, I, it was not what I would call a city, but it was something where I could find snail eggs and, and allow them to hatch. And we would go to camp and you bring home the pollywogs and the salamanders. Um, I wasn't very good with birds. My canaries always died. Um, but I did have a bullfrog. They saved it from a fate worse than death because it would have been used um, for pregnancy tests in the hospital. Um, and I had to catch it live flies. It didn't like die fly, you know, dead flies. So I really enjoyed this book. I mean, there was always really interesting things and one of the I mean I loved how she um, kept in engaging her children into some of the projects because one of the things I always tell tell my friends um, I rediscovered nature when I had children because they were a lot closer to the ground than I was hmm. and 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 it was it was a way of re um, not reimagining. It was re-energizing all of those curiosity things that I had as a child. So I, this book was amazing. That's it for now. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Donna. Uh, was there anyone else that wanted to chime in on that question? We can always revisit it if somebody thinks of something that jogs their memory, but if not, I'll move on to the next question. Okay, let me see here if I can pull up those. I can copy and paste the questions into the chat too after you go over them in case anyone forgets. Yeah, that would be helpful. That's okay. great, Alicia. And I should I should introduce Alicia. I, I'm I'm so sorry here. I introduced myself. I introduced Carrie, but Alicia Adolf has been a huge part of putting um, not just this book club session together. She's been she's been organizing all of these book clubs uh, events that we've been doing. She is our um, I was it not our she's Arizona Preservation Foundation's uh, public ally fellow and if you guys are not aware of the public allies program you should be aware of the public allies program um, because public allies uh, puts places young folks of uh, really um, uh, varied interest but the common interest is wanting to serve to do some form of public service um, and public allies also in their recruitment really focuses on diversity inclusivity um, and really grabbing folks from across the spectrum of backgrounds to channel them into a career in public service so um, Alicia has been working in preservation for a couple of years now and um, so she's the one behind the scenes running running the show here so thanks Alicia <laughs> I, that would be great if you could put it in comments. Okay, sorry. So I just interrupted. Okay, I'll go ahead I'm and read add to the, the first question before you move on. Um, and I was really excited to see this opportunity and um, that this book had been selected. I had actually listened to this book um, last year or maybe the year before. There's a Cultural Resources Protection Summit that's in Washington at the same place every year in May. And I've never been able to go in person, um, but I'm planning to this year. And so virtually a year or two ago, they actually started a, a virtual book club as well and picked this one. Um, and so I managed to get through it um, for that. And I say managed to get through it because... <laughs> 
uh, I run a small nonprofit, but we serve, we have a nationwide scope and we have, we have very small staff. And so this is what I'm currently reading. I don't know if you can see this. this is... <laughs> Valerie, can you put that into the chat so people can um, write yeah. that down? I saw this on a shelf and it just really spoke to me. Um, I'm, so, I'm so overwhelmed. I can barely make the time to read it. It's kind of like, like I have a speed reading book on my shelf too, but who has time to read that? <laughs> Doing chat as I'm, and I'm, I promise I will not monopolize. But Valerie uh, Grussing is the executive director of the National Association of Tribal Historic Preservation Officers. So um, yes, she does run a, a small nonprofit, but she's being pretty modest about that. NAFPO is uh, <laughs> essentially the uh, the um, organization that represents the interests of my colleagues that work in tribal historic preservation offices. And you all might not know that, along with state historic preservation offices tribes as sovereign nations have the ability to develop their own TIPO, um, Wallapai also being a tribal historic preservation office as well. So anyway, I digress. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. I heard that mentioned, Carrie, as well. Um, thanks, Catherine. And so um, I didn't have time to review this book before this club, and I'm I'm just remembering things that, that um, might have really resonated so much that they stuck from a year or so ago. And to this question, um, reciprocity, one thing that really um, that really landed with me when I was listening to it at the time was um, the chapter about, um, and the phrasing was, um, was our gifts are our responsibilities. And they go through, she goes through a list of examples um, from the plant from the plant and animal um, world from our relatives in that realm and um, each individual sort of, you know, exemplary like gift that they have and how it's their, therefore their responsibility to share that gift with, um, with the rest of us and sort of use their powers for good, I guess. And I hadn't thought about it in that way before. And that really, um, I think sort of from my perspective reframes um, you know, things that I had not thought about in that way before. And I find myself thinking about it frequently. I actually had an opportunity to go to um, a leadership training in Washington last week. Um, and so that's been, that was on my mind there um, as well. And sort of getting to know ourselves um, and our, our personality types and, and our leadership styles in the context of um, the leadership of organizations like this and others that the current age calls for um, and how we how we can be that. And it was interesting. I, I was looking forward to this discussion because I was thinking back to that as well um, last week. And so I think I hadn't thought about it in the context of a question about reciprocity, but I think it it is that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know we're supposed to be moving forward, but I, I'm remembering that was in the context of talking about um, the, the three sisters, that each of the three sisters brings the gift, and with the gift is the responsibility. If you're the, if you're the bean, you are providing the, nitri the, the nitrogen to the soil. If you are the corn, you are providing the stalk on which the, um, the squash and the bean can grow, and the squash, what was it that the squash did again? The squash moves out or something like that? I don't know. But then it was the human. I think she called the human the fourth sister and that the human without any of that, all of these cultivated um, crops, plants would not be able to do anything at all because they, they require planting. Um, so I, at that, yeah, I don't know if that's reciprocity, but man, I, I really do think that that's the whole idea of, of your gift is a responsibility. You need to use it else others can't do what they need to do. Did you, um, was there anything that came up at the leadership training that um, you would ref reflect on as it relates to the book, Valerie? Oh gosh, I would say that was the main one that's on the tip of my brain, but um, I will think about that as we discuss and I'll, I'll yeah, I'll share if there's, if anything comes else comes up. Okay, well, uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and read the second question. Um, 
The author uses examples of tribal oral traditional stories, ceremonies, and tribal language as a means to convey important ecological lessons. Pick a story, uh, a ceremony, or reference to heritage language differences that resonated with you and share your thoughts and insights. I, I just listed a couple examples. There's many, many more, like some of the Sky Woman stories, the Salmon Run Ceremony, the Onondaga and Thanksgiving Address, uh, the Potawatomi language. And you may have something you remember that I didn't list that you wanna reflect on. Hmm. Um. I really was impressed with the, the Thanksgiving address. I, I think it's really a powerful, I mean, just really powerful statement. And if we could take more of that to heart and be able to understand what it means and how to convey that towards humankind towards animals, uh, plants. Um, I would suspect we wouldn't be in the situation that we are in now for you know, a lot of things. It, it, I had to read it a couple of times. I mean, it, it is long, but, but still it's, it's what it says and what it's attempting to tell us. And it's, it, it should be a wake up call. I mean, it should, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't even know where, where I'm going with that, but it just really impressed me. Um, and I'm going, we've missed out, mm -hmm. least, you know, from, from that standpoint. And, and for people who, who aren't, um, what you might call really religious, at least believing in the, the Christianity um, aspect. It, it, it's very spiritual. And that's it. Thank you, Donna. I saw Anne had her hand up a moment ago. Would you like to share, Anne? Well, I was thinking the same thing. At one point, I, I highlighted that and I thought, I'm going to read that every day. Well, I haven't, but but uh, I too was very struck by it. And I guess going along with that was the traditional of the honorable harvest. Take only what you need and use everything you take. And I recently picked up a cookbook that is about using every single part possible of the um the fruits and veggies that you buy or pick or whatever. And I've been, I've been composting for a number of years. And now I take my compost to Donna's house for, <laughs> for her to compost. But, uh, but now I'm starting to, to try to use like the broccoli stalk and the ends of the asparagus that I used to throw away. I cook really hard and make soup out of and, carrot top pesto and just really using everything instead of throwing it in the trash or the compost bin. What's the name of that cookbook? Oh, I'll have to go get it. It's something about the whole bit. I'll go get it. But in the meantime, I'm wondering if all of you know about uh, the Blue Zones and his new cookbook it has a section on indigenous native oops uh, I can't get it in the right place there we go oh that looks really interesting blue zones American I'll go get the other cookbook great well just something that Donna said reminded me um like as it relates to the Thanksgiving address and I think someone else in the audience said after reading that, that they were, they wanted to um, start their day every day reading that. Um, and uh, on the Wallapai Reservation, we have a, an annual summer language immersion camp for a week where we camp out and we have the elders talking the language. And as part of that camp, um, the elder that, um, oh, here, 
let's take a moment to look at this book. The whole vegetable. It was very expensive. And it's, um, it's, I think she's either Australian or British. So I had to make myself a chart for the temperatures of the ovens. So to converge from Celsius. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for sharing the title of that book. I like to collect cookbooks and that seems like a good one. Um, any, anyhow, I was just sharing something about our, at our tribal language summer camp that we have the um, one of the elders that leads it. She'll um, take her drum and she'll start beating on that drum at 5am before the sun comes up and everybody has to line up in a circle to um, to greet the sun before it rises and we wait until the sun rises and then she'll sing a song. And then she'll do a prayer and then that's how we start our day and when you start your day that way it just incites mindfulness kind of like the thanksgiving address and being up that early in the morning too um kind of just puts you in tunes with the rhythm of of earth and they have a saying too that one of the elders he used to say it he's, he's no longer with us but it sounds crude but he would say uh, this is like a wallopi saying he would say don't let the sun pee on your face and so they say if you um, wake up and your face is all greasy, it's because the sun peed on your face, meaning that um, you didn't wake up early enough and now you're sweating. Um, and it's just kind of a way to shame you into getting up early and to um, <laughs> not being lazy <laughs> anyhow. So. So does anybody have any more they wanted to share on that second question? Yeah, I, I'd like to talk about um, or share a little bit about, um, and, and I thought she was like really like on top whenever she would talk about Sweetgrass. I mean, obviously it's the name of the, the title of the book, but you could just tell that this was like her plant. Like she loves this plant. And um, I loved when she talked, and I think she was also talking about this in the context of the honorable harvest, but like, don't take the first of something. Like, I love that practice of like, you go out with the intention, I'm going to collect a resource or gather a resource, but I'm not going to take the first that I see because it may be the only, and that is not, um, it, it's not a conservation model for, collecting a resource. If it's the only one there and you take it, it is gone. Um, and I just, I, I love that concept of life. Like it's so antithetical, I think, to how we live in this scarcity mindset. Again, like if it's the only, then you want it, right? And it's like, no, if it's the only, you leave it. Never take the first. It looks like Kristen has something to chime in on. Yeah, so admittedly, I haven't read or listened to the entire book. Um, a friend of mine told me about this book several years ago, and it's just been on my list. And then when I found out about this um, book club, I decided to, I found a copy at the library. So I'm in the very beginning. I've gotten through maybe five of the chapters, but um, relating to this question, one of the early chapters is called An Offering, and it's about when they were camping, when she was camping, when she was a child and her dad would wake up with the sun or before the sun and um, pour the first cup of coffee out and, and towards the end of the the story she asks her father like why do you do this where did it come from and it turns out that it had nothing to do with any kind of like cultural or historic ceremony it was just oh we you know i think it started because the first cup of coffee the grounds come out and we didn't want the grounds in our cup and so I just thought that was really interesting how you can, if something becomes a habit that you can, um, you know, if you do it over and over, you can make some kind of ritual out of it and, um, and practice gratitude while you're doing that ritual, whether or not it's, you know, has some greater significance. If it has some significance to you, then that's all that matters. So I thought that was a really interesting story. Yeah. Should we move on to the next question or was there anyone else that had something that came up they want to share? Uh, 
Okay, I'm going to go ahead and read the third question. Um, Western scientific practitioners can sometimes be dismissive of traditional ecological knowledge until studies use Western paradigms to prove what some indigenous practitioners already know to be evident. Reflect on the example of sweetgrass abundance being linked to traditional harvesting practices or another example you may care to share on. Silence. <laughs> I'm reading it again. There's a lot there. Yeah. Yes, Ann. Well, I'll share that when I was, uh, I got my master's degree at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, which was uh, included a lot of cross cultural studies. And one of the professors told the story about they were going to, and I, I probably got the details mixed up in my memory, but some engineers, they were going to build a dam across a river and the indigenous people kept telling them, no, 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 salmon and beaver are cousins. And the engineers like totally dismiss it, like what, that's crazy, what are they talking about? So they built the dam and of course it destroyed the ecology and the balance between the salmon and the beaver and everything else. And then they said, oh, uh, death. So it's just an example of the Western scientists thinking they know more and not listening to the ancient wisdom. Mm -hmm. Kristen, is your hand a legacy hand or do you have a comment? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to talk over. Um, Catherine, I think um, what's coming up for me here is probably, I suspect what's coming up for you too. And the what we constantly hear in consultations as far as the higher standard um, that tribal knowledge is held to in general, whether it's traditional ecological knowledge or just in general, what tribes have to say um, with regard to um, historic preservation and National Register nominations and um, Section 106 consultations under the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, it's it's just the way that the system has has shaped up and is um, the the power dynamic um, is is fundamentally out of balance. You know the the statute comes from 1966 when tribes were certainly not. Um, in the picture as far as speaking up for their interests in their own places um, and, and being protected. And it was 1992 amendments to the statute that added tribal historic preservation officers. And so since that time, you know, various sets of regulations that implement the statute and then, you know, agency policies that sort of tear off of that have come into being for whatever they're worth, but still on the ground, I think in day-to-day in -day practice, this is a perfect, this question is a perfect framing of the, the imbalance of power that continues to exist, even in this administration, which has made me really um, take a hard look at the expectations that I tend to put on <laughs> things. They came in really hot, talking a big game on day one about you know, strengthening nation to nation relations and um, environmental justice and um, all, all of the things that they are doing and trying to do in various regards. But there's places where all of those things intersect and sometimes conflict. And they are, I think, at, a, at this point, a combination of not knowing what to do about resolving those conflicts and hoping that people won't notice or that we will think that the offset is worth it. Like we need, you know, copper and lithium for clean energy things like, like car batteries. And so tribes just need to take one for the team if, you know, their sacred site happens to be over top of a particularly valuable deposit, which energetically, right? Of course it is. <laughs> There's a reason it was a sacred site. There's many reasons it was a sacred site. But um, I think I talked to you about that before, Catherine, too. But um, yeah, there's 
And they've also been doing a lot of really fine grained um, things. So like the guidance, you know, document for traditional cultural places is being revised and hey, provide us your input. Well, that's great. But the National Register of Historic Places doesn't protect anything. And until we change the statute and until the U.S. actually like signs on to the U.N. Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, particularly the clause about free prior and informed consent, none of the rest of it matters. Um, tribes are still fundamentally disempowered in, in the actual decision making processes on their places. Um, and that's like that's one part of it, right? Is is the day the day to day, you know, quote quote unquote consultations that happen and um, Western Western paradigms is the phrase in this question. Um, you know, trained archaeologists and anthropologists, white people with advanced degrees, do the same work and it's accepted and they write it up in a report. And if tribes want to make a contribution or question what's written or add to it and you know add a holistic Sort of layer of knowledge to it, then they're asked to prove it in ways that that other folks aren't, um, and to to show how they know it. And it's just wow. not. It's all it's all part of the system. <laughs> I could totally like go off on this and have a whole <laughs> session, but I wanted to go back to the book because this just I read these passage this one particular passage and it blew my mind about all this stuff, Valerie. That you know we deal with in historic preservation when it comes to uh, traditional cultural knowledge and um, basically uh, telling tribes that they need to conform um, to, uh, you know, a certain uh, rubric that we've created. We call it the National Register of Historic Places, but, you know, that we have to, uh, you know, that tribes need to, in order to play the game of recognizing a site as significant to a tribe, you've got to use this very white colonialist framework to do it. I was reading this and actually um, it's fresh in my mind because I was reading it today because I'm always doing everything at the last minute. So I was finishing this book, but um, which what she talks about and I'm, I'm on page 335 of my version, but it's like a goofy version. It's not that it's a, I don't know if anyone's reading that, but she's talking about how both science and traditional ecological knowledge is rooted in observation. And I don't know how many of you, when you're reading this, you were like, well, yeah, like, some of the observations that she has made and um, the elders that she works with have made, they are like, they look a lot like science, like the idea of the, the sort of reciprocity, these ecological concepts, like we go, yeah, that's, that's common sense. And like, like the, the three sisters, like that, you know, like, oh yes, the bean is providing nitrogen. Okay. Yeah. Like that's, we think of that as science, but it is not science. It's just observation. Um, and she she gets kind of like sad in one section where she starts talking and she says, while science could be a source of and a repository for knowledge, the scientific worldview is all often to enemy an, an enemy of ecological compassion. It is important to thinking about this lens to separate two ideas that are too often synonymous in the mind of the public, the practice of science and the scientific worldview that it feeds. Science is the process of revealing the world through rational inquiry. The practice of doing real science brings the questioner into an unparalleled intimacy with nature, fraught with wonder and creativity, as we try to comprehend the mysteries of the more than human world. Trying to understand the life of another being or another system so unlike our own is often humbling and for many scientists is a deeply spiritual pursuit so again this idea that science isn't the enemy but then she she continues and she says uh, i'll skip around here but she says the problem with science is that scientists are particularly good at learning about the lives of other species the stories they could tell the stories they could tell convey the intrinsic values of the lives of other beings, lives every bit as interesting, maybe more so than Homo sapiens. But while scientists are among those who are privy to these other intelligences, many seem to believe that the intelligence they access is only their own. They lack the fundamental ingredient, humility. And then she says, I dream of a world guided by a lens of stories rooted in the revelations of science and framed with an indigenous worldview stories in which matter and spirit are both given voice. I just, 
like she 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 got it like we can do science differently we can we can we just don't <laughs> and so to not take traditional ecological knowledge and put it at the same level is it's not just racist it's it's um it, it's not getting the whole picture it's it's not being a good scientist to be quite honest i mean because it's all systems of observation it's just one operates in this extractive sort of paradigm and the other operates on this whole humility reciprocity paradigm so why are we afraid of it i don't know anyway that's someone's got to have a reaction to that because that blew my mind um i have something i'd like to share um let's see i think valerie touched on on it and when she was talking about the section 106 consultation process about how um tribes are disempowered in the decision making process and as it relates to the question that i posed um i think also part of the issue is is that and that we hold i guess um you could you could say western science but we hold western science as the yardstick or the metric and then things get compared against it and um we need a paradigm shift it's not the metric um and tribes have their own metric and if we continue to compare against the metric we're only reinforcing that that the western scientific mainstream way is is the way and that we're some subgroup that's trying to measure up we're not trying to measure up we we self-evidently know that traditional ecological knowledge has its own um ability for um empirical knowledge which is what uh what, what we're talking about and so some, something does come to mind and this is something i want to tie into um, robin's book is that um i recall this was probably a couple decades ago when they were when all of the Monsanto stuff was happening and I attended a conference where Winona LaDuke was um, talking about how I think it was the University of Duluth was wanting to do DNA testing on wild rice and there was a concern that wild rice was going to they were going to mess with the genome and then potentially patent it and I know that this was around the time when the lawsuit happened in Canada with Prashish Meiser which gave in the court system gave the ability to patent life. And so one of the things that Winona LaDuke shared at this conference was, okay, the court system just upheld that, that companies can patent life. That's meaning if they change the genome, they can patent it. And so she essentially said, we as tribal people, when we go to court or when we do anything, we have to reject that ideology and that paradigm because the minute that we begin arguing within their framework, we've already lost. And if you stand firm saying, I don't believe it's right to patent life, and you maintain that ideology, um, you're holding steadfast to your cultural beliefs and you're not accepting the paradigm that's flawed. And um, so one thing that I, um, I have a, a minor critique of Robin's book is she, um, she did, you know, she criticized like the idea of we shouldn't have to buy water. Why do we buy water? Don't buy water. It's, a, you know, you shouldn't do that. Water should be free. Um, and then she talked about sweet grass should not be sold. It's a gift. It's a sacred gift. It shouldn't be sold. So she had these different things. And then, which is, was, which is getting at that paradigm shift that she was wanting to, to bring to the forefront. But then, um, she was using the term um, ecological services and she was using it um, just in common terms, the way that it's used. And I personally believe that as wildlife biologists and land managers, we should reject that as even an appropriate ideology because I don't believe, I think when you frame ecology in a service capacity, you're commodifying it. Hmm. And so I, I feel like she should have criticized the ecological services paradigm and this is i know i'm kind of getting into like uh esoteric language related to my field my background natural and cultural resources 
But I feel like um, when we start like using the enemy's language, like it's our own. And when I say enemy, I'm just talking about, you know, parts of the mainstream culture that, that are different from the tribal perspective. Um, then we're, we're losing the power of our indigenous perspective. And I felt like she should have, should have critiqued um, ecological services how, because that term only started being used maybe 15 years ago. And I feel like the minute you start framing ecology in a service, a service capacity, you're commodifying it. And that is not the native perspective of looking at the landscape or, or even as an ecologist. And so I know that sounds like I'm being um, nitpicky, but that's just, you know, I think she's a great author and it's a great book, but that's one critique I had. And I, I wish that she had delved into that. And um, maybe somebody else has a different opinion. Feel free to chime in. Don't be shy. Lou has something to say. I see her smiling. I think I saw Alicia. Oh wait, was it Lou? Did you? Lou. Have... Okay. Um, I don't disagree with you at all, Carrie. I was just um, the word that keeps coming to, to my mind is whiteness. You know, we talk about whiteness in professionalism all the time, right? Whiteness is like um, worship of the written word. Um, and just like this dominant culture that is just accepted because it's the soup that we all live in. Um, and so I was just making that connection. Uh, you call it a paradigm shift. And uh, yeah, it seems like a very similar concept, just a different, different word. Thank you. Should we move on to the last question or was there anything else that somebody wanted to circle back to? Hey, no, Alicia, did you wanna, did you have a comment there on this one or? I did earlier. I was gonna mention that in some of my sustainability classes at the University of Arizona, there's a lot of talk of like, like we've had the answers to a lot of our environmental problems for a long time. And um, I think there was a class specifically on I think we were talking about water usage and the student next to me who's men, a member of the awesome nation mentioned that the things that we were learning about in class are practices they've been doing their whole life mm -hmm. that's a great point alicia and uh you see a lot of that in uh i see a lot of it in western science where um, people talk about new discoveries and it gets treated as like this major scientific finding when it's something indigenous people have known for eons. Um, one example comes to mind, my folks live in the Northwest and there was an article written about how scientists just now discovered that beavers are estuarian creatures. They're not, they're not only in fresh water, they use salt water and this is a new discovery that nobody knew and how amazing and interesting and all I can think of is that you, you know, you this is not a new discovery, and this disempowers all the indigenous people that have lived there for eons and millennia, knowing and observing that uh, beavers utilize both saltwater and freshwater habitats. Now, did it escape Western scientific knowledge because by the time Western science showed up, like all of the fur trappers had probably killed off most of the beaver? And then 150 years later, the beavers that that um, survived, Western scientists began to notice, oh, they're in this habitat and this habitat. And so it's a new discovery. And then scientists get credit for being so clever and so smart. And then again, indigenous people's um, knowledge gets erased from existence. And um, that's a common problem. And I think your colleague uh, from Tana Atom probably a lot of indigenous people get really frustrated when they hear professors and other people um, tote these revelations that are, are not new and, and have been known by tribal people, but they don't, they don't see the light of day and they don't get the credit for it. Yeah. 
Well, I think I should probably move on to our last question, unless anyone has anything to say. Well, one, just one, one thing we were mentioning about observations. I've always been fascinated by um, the equinox and the observations that people have made and things line up and you're going, how long, how many years did it take them to realize it always happened at the same time? And you know, the, the going through the slots, I mean, and then they'll have some kind of symbolic uh, drawing or something that, that lights up. I mean, but it's that whole observation that we don't, I mean, <clears throat> The majority of us no longer do. I mean, scientists, yes, maybe they are observing things, but it, based on what I know and I've read, it was not just one or two people, indigenous people that are observing this. This, this was a, a matter of life. I mean, it, there were lots of people that observed it and the, it was celebrated. It was shared, that information was shared. I'm done. Definitely worth <laughs> contemplating. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go ahead with our last question here. Um, pick out something in the book that stood out to you and share with the group your thoughts. You know, I wanna give the opportunity for people to have their own creative freedom on what resonated with them. So I didn't wanna have every single question be something where I'm directing the direction. <laughs> So I'm sure everybody had a few favorite things that struck them. And I want to open the floor for some time on that. And I'm just going to encourage some folks who haven't spoken up perhaps to, um, to weigh in and let us know, even if it's just, this was my favorite chapter. Lisa Kramer, and then we'll go to Carolyn. Hi, yes, I have, my favorite part was the pond. The dilemma of how to, what gets broken down, what gets lost in the clearing of the pond, what gets saved and how, how it just the layer upon layer upon layer. But just, I was heartbroken at some of the things that she was saying that she had to kind of disturb and you know what weren't gonna make it, but the whole just the whole cleaning of the pond was just for me. I love mud, so mud and insects are my thing. So <laughs> that was just I thought that was a beautiful part of the book. And just going through the years of going through it, getting it together, realizing her daughters are too old now for it by the time she got it in place, then realizing that it is there for her grandchildren to come and visit and all that. I just thought that was a beautiful section. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And yes, Carolyn. Okay, so this kind of ties into the last subject too um, for Western paradigms and things, but the, I, the idea of, let's see, she mentions Sky Woman in comparison to Eve. And both women coming out of, of a garden, the Western garden, or the <clears throat> uh, Sky Woman building a garden and creating a garden for the well being of everyone, versus Eve coming out of uh, being given a garden basically and then being banished from the garden and having to uh, go out and, as she puts it, subdue the wilderness into which she was cast. And <clears throat> So I had a lot of philosophy classes back in my undergrad years. Um, and we always were talking about the Western intellectual tradition and how it comes out of um, comes out of these ideas that are are being held in the Bible of the the being cast out of the garden. And so everything um, you're Western thought is already 
into this mindset of the you're not good enough to be in the garden. You're already taken, you're held to be apart from, from the land and apart from nature. And nature becomes this thing that's dirty, that has to be subdued, that has to be um that has to be tamed and it has to be categorized and everything. And I think that that is one of the putting it in a dichotomous framework of the approaching it from the idea of sky moment where everything is being built up together versus the uh, the Western paradigm and the Western intellectual tradition of everything has to be, it has to be, as she says, it has to be subdued. And I think that, I don't know, that was really, it's because it's from what I know already, but it, it really struck me as, as something that was, was interesting. And um, I really liked that, that phrasing that she had there. Yeah, that's, that's a great um, observation and, and tying it into what Western philosophies are rooted in. So thank you for sharing your thoughts. That was very interesting. Yeah. Is it all women? Do we have 16 women here or 18? Is there oh, any men? Yes, yes, we do. We do. We <laughs> <laughs> don't stereotype. <laughs> a book club and the men run from the hills. I just, I don't know. <laughs> I see um, Kristen has her hand up. Yeah. Um, so again, I haven't read much of the book, but the chapters that I have read, each of them have stood out in their own way. I just think they're all very memorable, just the way she writes. Um, but I know something really stands out to me when I read it and I cry. And the beginning, I'm not even going to read it because it's going to make me cry just talking about it. But the beginning of um, the chapter and offering just really hit me. And really made me ponder like as a white person in America how to live my life in respect and show respect and um sorry um I don't know maybe deal with I don't know if it's guilt that I feel like misplaced that my ancestors did such horrible things like how do I live with that and just prove that I'm not that person I'm not those people. So it really did this to me, <laughs> just reading that little opening few sentences. So I just wanted to show that. Well, I think it's wonderful when um, a book can make you delve into yourself and want to be your, be your best self. And it seems like this book has everyone that has read it, it has touched people in some capacity in that way, um, wanting to do right uh, with uh, Mother Earth. <laughs> sounds, sounds cliche, but you know, wanting to do right to the land. And um, so I think that is one of the common threads of the book. And I think most of us who have read it probably have felt some capacity of that when I read it, I felt impoverished. Like, I, I just feel sad. Like, just, I, I when the, the chapter on um, the, the Onondaga Thanksgiving and how um, Kimmer said, you know, like, imagine just every day just getting up and your first thing that you do in, in, as a ceremony is stand together and, and be thankful for all the gifts that are being given to you. Like imagine doing that every day and then imagine you're a kid or worse, a non-white, an Indian kid in a classroom being forced to stand up each morning in ceremony together and say this pledge to a Republic 
I didn't even as a kid know what a republic was. And then I think one of the most poignant lines in the book, she was like, you know, and here we are as, as children pledging allegiance to a republic for liberty and justice for all. And she's like, as Native people, we know <laughs> intrinsically that's bullshit. But yet that's the ceremony collectively that we have chosen in the United States that that's, that's what we engage in. We, we have our kids engage in every day. It's not to thank the earth or for the gifts or any sort of gratitude. It's to basically acknowledge that the government is there and and we should appreciate the government. What? <laughs> How impoverishing has like has that that's just where do we go if that's if that's what we give to our children every day? If if that's the ceremony they get, how do we I don't know. It made me sad. I do think even if, um, you know, she she sheds light on all, gives examples of many beautiful cultures that are in tune, um, regardless of anybody's ancestry, I think if we all go back, and I think you even said this, Catherine, when you were talking about race, the human race, if we all go back far enough in our lineage, we're all people of the earth, and we don't have to I, I, I get your sentiment about feeling impoverished, but we don't have to feel um, that we're lacking a culture that's connected to the earth if we turn inward and realize that deep down in our soul, you know, we all are rooted to this earth. We all rely on it. And whether we grew up in a native culture or some other culture, if we kind of attune ourselves with that um, sentiment, I think we can recalibrate ourselves, even if we're in a dominant culture that makes us recite the Pledge of the Allegiance. <laughs> That's my thought on it. And I'm sure that there's a diversity of thought on it, but I, I have you know, heard expressed at different times in my life. I don't know if it's called white guilt or what people call it, but where there's this, um, feeling feeling this heaviness for everything that's gone wrong and and you know it's 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 a healthy reckoning to know history but um we we can you know we can all whatever our background is we can all get in touch with somewhere back in our history all of our cultures no what no matter what continent you're from are rooted in the earth it's just going further back in time um before you get to that that's that's how I look at it, and I know there's a diversity of thought on that, but I'm actually I'd like to get your take on a statement that she makes about immigrants and how um, you know like the colonial mindset is an immigrant mindset of coming to a place that is not yours, and I'm wondering like like does that in your in your opinion affect like how I don't know can can an, she seems to be saying that an immigrant can't ever really grasp place like an indigenous person. And I, and I use these with like not capitalized and, and capital E's, but just like in general, like, like socially, like that the connection when you're an indigenous to a landscape is different than when you are an immigrant to a landscape. Um, yeah, I think there's a level of truth in that, that it's like we can never walk in someone else's moccasins, like somebody that's comes from a lineage that has been tied to a place for eons is going to have a different perspective than someone that's immigrating from a different place. But but I, I do think like, and what comes to mind is that uh, she was reflecting, I think, when she lived in Kentucky and her mother befriended the woman, I can't remember the woman's name, but there was a there was a neighbor that her mother befriended from Kentucky and she was just like a down-home lady and she did a lot of down-home stuff. You know, to me, the woman in Kentucky was very rooted in the earth and she's not gonna have the same like um, cultural like ties to the land as a native person but she was still somebody that had respect for the, the earth 
and um, was sort of like living in tune. So, I mean, yes, I, I do think that there is, there is a distinction, but I don't think that that has to like define, like sort of define your experience, like to categorize yourself. Well, I'm of the immigrant paradigm and so I'll never get there. You know, I, I, don't, I don't really see it that way. But I do think, yeah, there is, there's a difference. Somebody who's got lived experience from a long lineage is just gonna have that ingrained in, in their soul. And then someone that's an outsider can still live, live in a, a harmonious way, but that connection, it doesn't run in the same, at the same depth, you know, and their connection may be tied to a different place that's in their ancestral memory. Oh my gosh, it's too late to be having in-depth. I know this is, I, I, I'm realizing this now as for some of us who are on the East Coast, it is very late and we are having like the most heady of conversations, but I really feel like this book, I mean, how could you not? It just, it, it it's like a, I don't know, this book was amazing. Um, and I, we are getting- I, I want to say in now. both cases, I think there's similarity in these two comments, Kristen, and what you said and um and Catherine and Carrie and what you were saying just now and that um we uh a lot of it is about um recognition and acknowledgement and naming naming the things that that you're talking about right and then shifting our our come from for for both of those things and so um I think for many of us who went through, you know, the public school system at the time that we did, um, the, the offerings in history and social studies were lacking. <laughs> and so it's been in our adulthood and in our own seeking to learn more that I think we start to feel these feelings right and that's one word for it is is white guilt but it's another way to look at it I think is is um you know whether our ancestors directly in our direct line played you know whatever role they may or may not have played is irrelevant but for the indigenous communities for the descendant communities like this this knowledge was always there whether it was talked about or not you know, the, the things that happened, the, the genocide that happened and, and the removal and um, for the rest of us to be starting to get a clue finally, you know, on a, on a larger scale is that's what it's going to take um, for healing to start to happen. And um, Carrie, you asked about anything from, from, the training that I took away last week and not specifically in relation to the book, but a revelation that I did have. And the only other executive director there was a co-executive director of, of an organization in Canada. And he was a first nations member and he's a co-executive director. So for one thing, I was like, Oh my God, we need, we need a co-executive director situation, <laughs> like right off the bat, um, which we need budget for. But um was about power dynamic. And so, you know, Canada is like 10 years at least ahead of where we are with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which, you know, groups are beginning to ask the administration for now, which is still, it's not, I'm not optimistic that that's going to happen anytime soon, but those are, those are big words. Those are heavy words. And I think fundamentally, like, until we're all in this together that's not like we have to all be in this together for that to be in the realm of possibility and then also it's related to the power dynamic right like until we fundamentally like we as humans all have a say in the things that the decisions that affect us then um then then it's just lip service but um I think the the sensation of um, beginning to share that knowledge and the weight that goes along with it, um, I think is one way to look at that. And then, um, yeah, 
it, it relates to what you're saying too, Catherine. And Lisa, I also wanted to say um, the, the chapter that you mentioned, that was also one that just, I mostly listened to this in the car and I sat in the car for who knows how long to, to finish that chapter. I think it was like mother's something, I want to say burden, but I can't remember what it was called, but the cleaning of the pond and just. I think it was called the consolidation of water lilies. That was one, but there was something more specifically about, about mothers too. There were two that I just, I just wept. <laughs> like if you're, if you're a mother, you know how, how fast it, I mean, everything's just the blink of an eye. Like the, what do they say? The days are slow, but the years are fast or something. It's yeah. <laughs> really, really powerful. Well, we are over time which did not surprise me because there is so much to chew on here. Um, and I just want to um, take an opportunity right now to thank you so much, Carrie, for taking the time to moderate our, our nation book club. This is only the second one we've done. So if you get the sense that we're disorganized, you're probably right. <laughs> we will get better each time we do this. Um, the last time we did this was also a fabulous book. It was how the word was passed. Um, and I have to say, um, Braiding Sweetgrass, man, I, now we got to really pick really good books because this was, I mean, seriously, I'm not kidding, top five books in my own personal lifetime, and I read a lot. Um, and um, so with that, um, I'm going to pass it off to Alicia because Alicia is going to talk to us about what our next book is. We're aiming to do these every other month. And again, the idea is not to, um, you know, I didn't want to create a club that would just be like a bunch of archaeologists, historians, what cultural people talking about, um, you know, the work that we do. It's just really broadening the net of um, heritage preservation uh, to really just talk about issues that link us all together um, in terms of our interests and our passions. And um, I think that this has been a really great discussion. And I learned. Um, more about what the Wallapai tribe is up to with your ethnobotany program, which I'm very excited about, super excited. Um, I'm not going to spill any beans here, but um, keep your eye open for the news because Wallapai has got some good stuff going on up there in terms of work that they're doing. And um, so just, they're making news up there. Let me just put it that way in the most positive of ways. Um, Okay, Alicia, do you want to talk about what we're going to do in June? Yeah, I'll share my screen. Our next book will be The Anthropocene Reviewed by um, John Green, and it'll be June 20th, which is also a Tuesday, 7 p.m., same time, 7 to 8.30 through Zoom. And keep an eye out on our newsletter and our social media for the registration link to that. And I have not read this one. I don't know if anybody has, but it's supposed to be quite enjoyable and funny at times. And it's basically, um, this author is doing like Yelp style reviews for like all sorts of facets of culture and um, pop, some pop culture, some just sort of the ways we funny humans behave, but he, he does like a little review and they're short little essays. So it'd be a fun read. But Valerie, I'm looking at this book that you recommend, and I'm thinking this one needs to needs to be on the list as well. It's got a lot of one panel comics in it. It's a, it's really oh, okay. it's really quick read too. Okay, good. It's heavy material though. Pardon? Did you, did you read her other one called Trauma Stewardship? No, I, I purchased oh, this one at the at the retreat I was at, but I think that, that one's going to be next. <laughs> sounds like wow too so yeah anyway. yeah okay and again and one one other thing we always record our sessions and they will be posted on youtube okay very thank good you. all right thank you and then thank you alicia thank and you. Thank you reiner with apf for putting this together and most of all thank you carrie for leading us in such a great discussion thank thanks all for attending <laughs> bye-bye Bye. Bye.